Perfect. Uh, now we are officially recording. Uh, thanks again for everyone joining us today. Uh, we'll give folks one more minute uh, to come in. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, um, share where you're from and your organization. We will get started shortly. Okay, great. Um, I think we're up to 25 folks. So I think folks will continue to filter in. I know we ran a, a tiny bit over um, on the intro and that that was an awesome, awesome job by Dia and Paul and the singers. So I'm really, really happy uh, everybody's here today. Uh, hi, Sherry. Hi, Eric. Hi, Richard. Hi, Sparkle. Thank you for coming today. We're going to talk about federal education policy, past, present and future. Uh, my name is Reed Setzer. I'm our Director of Government Affairs here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been with Ed Trust for a little over two years now, um, and this is the fourth or fifth time I've done a similar presentation on our boot camps. So hopefully for some folks, it'll be a refresher um, on what has happened uh, in the past year or so. And uh, for some, hopefully it'll be totally new and, and really helpful and instructive. Um, so just a few things you know, off the top. Uh, we spend most of the time kind of moving through what's happened in the you know past 18 months or so. We'll talk a little bit about where we are right now um, with a host of, of uh, federal education policy opportunities and initiatives, um, and then talk about the future, which will mostly encompass uh, what we think will happen in, in 2022. Uh, we hope after this year you'll feel you have a greater understanding of you know what the federal government's actions were in response to COVID and what they're doing right now in relation to COVID relief um, for our nation's education system. Um, you understand what Ed Trust is interested in and focused on and what we help uh, hope to engage in uh, both right now and into the future. Um, and then you have a stronger understanding of how best uh, to align your own priorities, uh, you know, at the federal and state levels over uh, the next, uh, you know, next year or so. Uh, so the final thing I'll just say is that this presentation is uh, being performed for strategic planning purposes only. Um, the idea is that your organizations can begin to think about how these policies may or may not impact your agendas and how they align with ours. Um, and we would ask that you not share this material or recording publicly, although I, I do expect it will be posted uh, you know, after the fact to share within your organizations, as will the uh, presentation. So uh, with all that, uh, let's get started on the substance. Uh, I will just say, too, we'll have uh, there's a Q&A slide at the end um, and we'll save time for that. Uh, as things pop up, um, if you want to maximize, uh, you, know, you know, the, the, the time at the end, um, if you could hold, hold questions till the end, that would be great. But if things pop up in the chat, um, no worries. I'll try, try and get to those as we go. So, uh, as I mentioned, you kind of have a past, present, future, uh, breakdown here. Uh, the past, when we say the past, we don't mean, uh, uh too far, uh, too, too, uh, much in the past, uh, mostly, uh, March, 2020 to March, 2021. Uh, which will encompass uh, a quick review, relatively speaking, of what the federal government's COVID response uh, initiatives were uh, during that time period. Uh, the present will focus on sort of April of this year to, to today and a little bit beyond that, um, specifically on the pivot um, uh, from only focusing on COVID to kind of combining the ongoing COVID response that we're seeing 
uh, you know, with uh, systemic ideas, you know, about how things can change and policies that, that need to be improved and updated and made more equitable. Um, and then the future will be sort of the end of whatever this reconciliation Build Back Better Act period is, which I'll get into, um, into 2022. So how does the COVID response continue? Um, how does reconciliation get implemented if it is passed? And then what else is going on? Because in the meantime, there's the pandemic happening and then there's actual uh, standard issue government practices and policies that have been a uh, focus of many, many groups and many people for a long time as well. So how, how are we going to balance those moving forward? So first, we'll start with what the government uh, has done, specifically Congress, in conjunction with the uh, both administrations. Uh, you know, the first couple things, CARES Act is obviously the biggest thing, um, you, you know, from March of 2020, but did want to just highlight what came right before that for one specific reason, which I'll touch on in a second. Uh, then you have the December relief package, uh, uh, CIRSA, um, or just I've been calling it the December package, but the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act and the American Rescue Plan Act, um, which folks will be probably most familiar with from March of, of this year. Uh, so I would just say I don't plan on going into detail uh, on all of these things, but we'll just highlight a few things from each of them. Uh, so as I mentioned, this Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, signed into law before we, I think, really fully understood um, how the pandemic was going to change all of our lives and, and all of the systems in which we operate in the institutions in, in America. Uh, the one thing I did want to highlight with this is, is that it did create uh, the PEBT program. Um, and essentially, you know, this was a uh, pretty direct acknowledgement that schools are pretty vital community institutions in delivering food uh, to, to children. Uh, and, and, you know, this was a very creative and effective solution um, to ensure that there was still access to those school meals, even when schools were physically closed and, and in-person learning uh, was not taking place at that time. Uh, you know, I think it's also invited a lot of constructive thought about how to re-envision, um, you know, this system as a whole, um, how to make it more expansive, um, quite frankly, more effective and, and generous um, for, for schools and students. Um, and we've seen that focus kind of throughout all the relief packages into the debate we're having right now um, with the reconciliation uh, bill. So I would say uh, Thursday, there is a, a panel that will get a little bit deeper in, into nutrition policy, um, which may touch on some of these things. It also will touch on the higher ed side of it. Uh, but I did want to just flag that for, for folks who are interested in, in the nutrition policy piece of this. Uh, but after that, as you can see, that was mid-March. We're already at the end of March, only two weeks later, and we, we passed the CARES Act. Uh, the main thing to highlight here is that it created the Education Stabilization Fund that most folks will be familiar with, which is essentially the pipeline that has delivered relief aid uh, directly to uh, you know schools and, and colleges and state authorities uh, throughout the entire pandemic. Um, it was used uh, in December and in March again to deliver uh, uh, more funds. You can see the initial salvo was about $30 billion total, and as we will see, it, things escalated uh, from there. Uh, also worth noting, it, as part of this package, um, the student borrower. Uh, issue flagging this because uh, as of now, the payment pause on, on federal student loans has been extended until the end of January um, of this upcoming, uh, you know, next next year. Um, you know, this is when this came into play. So by the time January comes around, you could be looking at close to two years um, of students, or I should say borrowers not having uh, to make payments, having their interest paused. Um, you know, and that has been, I think, tremendously helpful in, in sort of booing the, the economy. Uh, given there are you know roughly you know 45 million plus uh, student loan borrowers out there that you know been able to pocket that money, be able to save it, um, and be able to spend it on necessities, especially given all of the economic turmoil that's taken place and continues to take place uh, during the pandemic. But this is when that originated, um, and that executive order is set to expire, as I said, at the end of January. A lot of other stuff in the CARES Act. Um, you know, happy to, to answer questions about that as well. But this is sort of the, the beginning salvo here. Moving to December, so folks will remember there was a very long period of time from April to December of last year where it was unclear if they were going to pass another relief package um, before uh, the end of the year. Um, you know, this was uh, you know, tremendously uh, important, I think, um, to both uh, you know, maintain a lot of the sort of economic um, life rafts, I would say, um, that, that folks grabbed onto uh, during CARES um, that American people desperately needed. Um, you know, so you see the Education Stabilization Fund here has gone from 30 to 82 um, you know, a billion, uh, most of that going into ESSER II, which is the fund designed to uh, send money to, to K-12 schools. Uh, this also created an emergency broadband benefit, um, which provided $3.2 for low-income families to access broadband um, through a monthly subsidy. 
you know, flagging this because this is actually part of the bipartisan infrastructure package. Um, the permanent uh, installation of this benefit, it works a little bit like Lifeline, um, which currently subsidizes home phone service for, for families um, and is a, actually a tremendous victory. Um, this is also a program that can be accessed by Pell students um, in addition to, to lower income factory uh, for families, I should say. So uh, we're hoping that at some point that package will be resolved. We won't get into too much of that today, um, but that is the one piece um, that we have been incredibly interested in. Um, and want to see uh, get finished. Uh, the other thing to mention uh, is that the December package uh, not only continued on the line of COVID relief, but it also had to fund the government and keep the government open and contained a lot of actual um, what we call authorizing changes. So changes to the underlying law um, of, of America, not necessarily just the funding uh, streams to existing programs. Uh, one fundamental change was that the, the Pell ban, uh, which had been in place since 1994 uh, for uh, students who are incarcerated was lifted. Um, which uh, we hope and expect uh, will lead to a tremendous expansion of opportunities for students who are incarcerated to get uh, education, higher education while they are, uh, you know, currently incarcerated. So, you know, this is a tremendous victory you know, for equity. After the, the ban was put in place, you saw programs uh, dramatically shrink you know, by over 90 percent um, in terms of the amount um, that were offered nationwide. Uh, the Obama administration, continued by the Trump administration, um, did create Second Chance Pell. Um, which which reached close to you know 10,000 students, um, which were essentially an experimental site that allowed some uh, colleges to get Pell and operate um, in, in carceral facilities. Um, they've actually announced a third expansion of that program, and we'll be doing some regulatory work um, uh, on installing uh, that 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 program, or I should say, uh, detailing regulations on how that ban is going to be lifted exactly, and who's going to be responsible for quality. Um, and making sure that students are not taken advantage of, that are provided with the same exact opportunities that students are not incarcerated uh, are, are uh, provided with. Um, and Jonathan in the chat flagged, uh, we do have a state policy scan uh, about these policies and what's going on in each individual state uh, in this space coming out very soon. And I'll touch a little bit more on this uh, going forward. So finally, um, just in terms of the past, let's just touch quickly on uh, the American Rescue Plan. Um, there's been a lot written about this. You can see how the total has grown, right? In the Education Stabilization Fund, it's gone from 30, 31 to 82, to now it's at 165. Uh, so you're seeing you know, a tremendous infusion of resources, um, which are both sorely, sorely needed, uh, but also you know, there are some uh, restrictions on this money. As you can see, um, there's a couple set asides to address interrupted learning. You can see the largest one is this 20% um, for LEAs to address unfinished learning. It was something I trust very much pushed for. Um, we've subsequently come out with recommendations on how best to address an unfinished learning. Um, and there will be more uh, uh, discussions of that during this boot camp. Um, but that was a tremendous victory for us alongside um, seeing you know things like maintenance of equity uh, designed to prevent uh, cuts um, from institutions serving historically underserved students, uh, which we saw during the recession. That was also included and was a new thing that has never been included in a, a federal relief package like this before. Um, so that also has had guidance come out about how to implement it, something we are tracking closely. Um, and then also worth flagging uh, early childhood education. Um, this is obviously a key focus of the current reconciliation package, um, but did also uh, want to highlight here, this is what expanded the child tax credit and made it fully refundable. So that child tax credit, um, depending on how many children you have and how old they are, um, for millions of families has been going directly into their bank account since July. It's now October. That is set to expire at the end of this year. Um, and is a key, key topic of discussion of, you know, are we going to extend that out? If so, how long can we do that for? How do we measure that priority versus other early childhood, child care priorities? Um, and how do we measure that priority versus all the other priorities in the bill, both in just the education space um, but but even other things in the bill, you know, outside of the education realm. Um, so that, that's something we're flagging as a current topic of uh, discussion and something that has, has come up. Uh, you know, this is where it, it originated. Uh, another follow up quickly. And again, there's a lot on these pages. There's a lot of information here, uh, but just wanted to highlight uh, broadband access. So in addition to the benefit that was created in December for families, uh, Congress authorized another seven billion um, for schools and libraries uh, to get devices and connectivity for K-12 students. Uh, this builds on an existing program called E-Rate. Um, this is the most, uh, you know, a largest amount of funding this program has received and is designed to basically close the digital divide uh, for as long as, as humanly possible, because we know it's not going to be enough money to close it permanently. Um, we are pushing for, for more money to be included in this reconciliation package. But however, it is going to facilitate remote learning, which is still taking place in many places around this country. Um, and for that window of time, um, will help students learn 
at home um, and be fully uh, equipped uh, to participate in their education. Uh, so this was a tremendous uh, victory. We, we pushed very hard for this as well. Um, didn't get uh, a substantial amount um, in, in the prior packages. So uh, this was about over half um, of what we think um, it would take to close the, the digital divide. So this was another thing that we were really uh, celebrating at the time and continue to monitor. Uh, you know, we'll touch on that a little bit down the road as well. First, uh, let's get to the present. Um, so what is happening right now? So as I mentioned, you know, you just saw the ARP slides. They're being, uh, that, that package is starting to be implemented. We'll touch on that. The American Families Plan started to change the conversation about what comes next. Um, and then reconciliation, build back better, and appropriations. Um, so this will touch on things you may have seen in the news somewhat recently over the past month or month and a half. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, about where we are right now. So right now, um, in terms of implementing these packages, um, the administration is uh, doing quite a bit. Um, they're continuing to monitor the implementation of elements of the American Rescue Plan. Um, they've issued, I believe, two different volumes um, uh, uh, under the, the nomenclature of handbooks. Uh, volume one focused on safe reopening from a public health perspective, mostly. Um, and volume two did touch on the, the pedagogical aspects of, of um, both addressing the needs of discrete populations, um, such as students that are experiencing homelessness and, and disabled students, but also uh, just it, it finishing unfinished learning in general. Um, so those are two resources um, that they put out earlier this year. Um, there's additional guidance, as I mentioned. There's some on maintenance of equity. Um, there are other, uh, other things around um, informing some uh, money that was set aside for students who are experiencing homelessness, um, actually as an amendment on the floor in March when the American Rescue Plan passed. Um, so there's a ton of resources out there for folks, and Ed is continuing to use those and promote those. Uh, they're conducting school visits, tours to promote safe reopening. Um, helping local schools enact mitigation plans, both through technical assistance and they've created a grant program uh, to basically uh, give districts money to pay fines um, that states uh, may have assessed against them uh, because local school boards, local officials have implemented mask requirements uh, and the states are trying to ban those mask requirements. Um, so they've supported uh, districts in keeping students safe. Uh, in terms of the ARP money, so you saw that large number, right, um, that 180 or so from March that was in the American Rescue Plan, uh, about 120, 125 of that was for K-12 schools. Uh, two thirds of that was given out immediately. However, the final one third states had to apply for um, and specify their plans um, on, on how to both not only employ these funds appropriately, but how to uh, you know address uh, gaps and uh, you know in 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 inequities that have developed and been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, almost every state has submitted their plan um, and it has been approved. Um, and then states now have until January of 2025 to allocate all of their funds. So we are definitely encouraging states to think about long term. What are the pieces you can put in place while this money is in place to keep it going afterwards? And that may involve state and local advocacy uh, as well. Uh, so that's sort of the ongoing implementation plan that we're seeing currently. So that's all ongoing. While that happened, you had the administration put out a couple of different ideas. One was the American Jobs Plan, um, which does have some workforce elements to it, things that we were focused on. But the primary uh, uh, bucket of, of policy proposals that we were uh, most uh, influential on and involved with and are working on uh, was in the American Families Plan. Um, so as you can see, this contained things like Pell increases, America's College Promise, which is a federal state partnership uh, to create a tuition free community college uh, for students. Uh, dedicated funds for evidence-based student support programs like CUNY ASAP for those that are familiar. So these are wraparound services programs that provide counseling, uh, transportation vouchers, on-campus child care, in addition to tuition and fees uh, to get students not only to school but through school uh, as efficiently and effectively as possible. Uh, funds for educator diversity and strengthening teacher training, uh, dedicated funds for HBCUs, MSIs, and TCUs, and then substantial investments in early child education and universal pre-K uh, alongside additional investments in nutrition programs. So you're seeing here a pretty comprehensive set of ideas, uh, many of which were talked about during the presidential campaign. Uh, that was so as what was laid upon the table by the administration. Uh, during the summer, uh, Congress sort of took these ideas. They tried to figure things out internally. We'll get to sort of their, their discussions and negotiations in a, in a second. Um, but this was sort of what everyone was talking about and say, hey, these investments are needed. These are the levels we need. This is what has to be in there. And this was this was roughly a, a shade over four billion dollars total, um, according to some documents and projections. Uh, where we ended up 
uh, in September is in reconciliation in the Build Back Better Act. Um, I'm going to set aside uh, some other things that happened on procedural side. Folks may have noticed there was a vote in August about a budget resolution and all these technical things. At the end of the day, the bottom line is we have unlocked the reconciliation, which means we've unlocked uh, a 50 vote threshold in the Senate um, for the majority to to pass anything. Um, so this is how they did the American Rescue Plan in March. And this is how uh, congressional Democrats will have to do the Build Back Better Act. So they need all 50 senators to vote yes. Uh, they do not expect a, a single Republican to, to vote yes on this package. So uh, what does that mean in practice? It means that uh, when you know the, the, the bill was released, <laughs> Uh, you have seen some of those numbers on that prior page uh, come down quite a bit, um, and we will kind of touch on on uh, you know the specifics of that uh, you know in a second. But we just say you know this has been an ongoing thing; it's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, but as we are sitting right now, you had a six trillion figure put forward by progressives. As I mentioned, the families plan was four point four uh, trillion, and then now we're looking at the three point five trillion number. Uh, which is where sort of most of the caucus and the White House had settled and said, okay, we'll do that. Uh, however, uh, Senators Manchin and Cinema, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, want to limit the, the overall number of spending, uh, overall amount of spending even further. Um, as such, it looks like they're hovering around $2 trillion right now. Um, Senator Cinema has not really articulated any public demands. Um, Senator Manchin has been a bit more publicly available, I think, um, to discuss where he has been uh, approaching this from. You know, I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we are happy to see most of the priorities listed in, in the prior slide included in the package. Um, but what is unclear is, are they going to cut things? Um, you know, are they going to cut things wholesale? So something like America's College Promise is about $110 billion. Uh, for us, this looks to be the biggest program that's under threat out of all the programs in the, the prior slide. Uh, and I'll just go back for a second as a refresher. There are elements of all of these things. Um, oh, did I hop over this? No. My apologies. Sorry about that. Where are we here? So this was in the family's plan. And here's what's in Build Back Better. So my apologies. So basically, I was on the procedural side, but this is just a quick refresher of everything that's in the Build Back Better Act. Uh, as you can see, there are elements of everything in the family's plan. So they took what the Biden folks uh, proposed, and then they uh, essentially... Uh, put it into law, which is what we wanted to do and, and was was really promising. Uh, however, all of these numbers on this are lower than the investments proposed, uh, for the most part, not all of them. The child care uh, piece remains uh, about what it was. Uh, and now there's discussions, thanks to Mansion Cinema uh, and some House moderates, on how do we pare these down further. So when you're seeing $110 billion for a federal state partnership, uh, you know there's a couple of things you could do with that. You could make it shorter in years. Right now, it would run for five years. Uh, you could make it four or three. Uh, you could uh, also just make it means tested, which has come up quite a bit. So instead of uh, that free messaging, which we do see is important, has increased enrollment for these programs, even though Ed Trust has done a lot of writing about how they can be made more equitable. And there's a lot of variation right at the state level on how, quote unquote, good or how generous it is for students or how effective it is for students. Um, quite frankly, that free headline uh, has been effective, uh, you know, in, in certain states. Uh, so, you know, I think. If they did means test it, you know, that might be where we end up here, um, but that would not be ideal. Uh, however, getting language on the books for a federal state partnership is really important because that's stuff that can be changed and modified and scaled up over time. And if it's included in reconciliation, you can ostensibly make positive changes through reconciliation in the future as well. Um, so this is a key uh, piece for us. I think it's the most uh, one that's under threat right now um, and, and something that we are definitely pushing on quite a bit at the federal level. Uh, also worth flagging, you know, student success program funding that is tied into ACP. Um, so while, uh, you know, you have these programs that exist right now, independent of, of other strings, how the bill is written, um, that fund, which again would be used to scale up evidence-based student success programs, is uh, subject to opting into the federal state partnership. Um, there's some, some additional details in the chat as well, which, which can be helpful here. I know it's a lot of information. It's very dense, but um, important to note that you would have to opt into these things. It's also important to note um, that the early childhood and universal pre-K piece functions fairly similarly, um, where states would have to opt in to participate to receive uh, federal funds. Uh, so this is an ongoing discussion um, about 
uh, what's in the, the Build Back Better Act. These are all very, very important things and everyone is pushing very hard to make sure they all stay in. Um, however, uh, as noted, we are at a, a bit of a, a negotiating impasse. So just going back to where we were before, uh, there's a new soft deadline to figure this out. Um, and that's Halloween, which is sort of a kind of a, a trick or treat commentary there. But uh, at the end of the day, they are trying to set benchmarks to force action, which is what needs to happen. Uh, I don't think they will get this done by Halloween. Um, and by done, I mean just passing both the Build Back Better Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Framework through the House. Um, for as a refresher, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Framework has already passed the Senate. So as soon as that passes the House, that's done. Um, and therefore, moderates, which they care the most about the BIF, would then be free to vote against uh, the Build Back Better Act unless um, they've already come to an agreement ahead of time. So that's what they're trying to get right now. Um, you know, and, and finally, as I mentioned, uh, the overall strategy remains un unresolved here. Uh, you know, I think we, like I said, we have a ways to go uh, on this uh, in particular. So that is taking up, I would say, uh, the vast majority of bandwidth um, for folks at, at the federal level. Um, moving ahead quickly, I'll touch a little bit on uh, appropriations. Uh, folks may have seen, um, I think it was recently as yesterday, the House passed a debt ceiling raise until December 3rd. Um, they also, uh, Congress also passed a continuing resolution or a CR to keep the government open until December 3rd back in September. Uh, so what that has done is set a, a deadline, um, independent of everything I just talked about, of December 3rd uh, to pass something to fund the government possibly for the remainder of the fiscal year, which is until uh, September 2022, uh, and raise the debt ceiling for some period of time into the future. Uh, this is also totally up in the air. Um, it is another thing just to be aware of because this will be going on simultaneously uh, with them trying to finish the reconciliation package. And I'll touch a little bit more on approach as we get to uh, the future. So here's what's to come um, over you know, the next uh, you know, calendar year or so. Uh, until the midterms, which are uh, scheduled for, you know, about 13 months from now. Um, things to be thinking about, things to be aware of. Um, and then, you know, we can hopefully circle up on any, any questions at the end, because I know there, there's a lot there. So moving first to implementation. So if they do actually get all this done, uh, I do think because of the nature of the systemic changes proposed, you will have uh, an intense amount of focus will be required from the department. Uh, to get all this off the ground and, and up and running smoothly. Uh, you know, as noted in prior boot camps and things you may have read, the reconciliation process is designed uh, only to impact, you know, fiscal changes. Uh, it's not really supposed to allow you to, to write law in the way you would normally. Uh, therefore, a lot of um, things like reporting, uh, oversight functions, application requirements, all these things, you can't really write a lot of that into law through this process, which means Ed has to write it. Uh, as you're seeing a little bit of this with ARP, right? They're doing a lot of guidance. Um, they're, they're doing some regulatory work, like all that has to be done. And, and quite frankly, I think this would be more complex um, than some of that. Uh, so that's you know implementing federal state partnership for free community college tuition and fees. What do states have to do to formally opt into that? How do you monitor their obligations? Because they do have to maintain a level of spending uh, to be uh, participate in that program. Um, so that's something it has to track and monitor and conduct oversight of. Uh, child care investment as well. Um, a lot of the child care funding is building capacity. Um, so you know, there are requirements about serving low-income populations, for instance, in the law. Um, how do they make sure that states are doing that with the money we're sending them or the federal government is sending them? Uh, same with universal pre-K. Um, all this stuff requires states to opt in and do certain things to, to access these funding streams. Um, and again, there'll be applications for smaller programs as well that are funded um, for the first time through, through this program. So these are all things that are going to that's going to be a, just a, an ongoing process for folks that's going to require a lot of federal state uh, interaction. Uh, additionally, setting that aside, you have the quote unquote Biden agenda, the regular things that he had ran on outside of COVID um, that, quite frankly, a lot of education advocates at the federal and state level were expecting any new administration to tackle. Uh, you know, right now they are engaged in what's called negotiated rulemaking. Um, as a quick refresher, uh, if you want to make regulatory changes to uh, higher education programs or programs in the Higher Education Act, specifically in Title IV, um, which is where all the student aid programs are located, um, you have to go through what's called negotiated rulemaking. Um, practically speaking, this means that instead of what we would call a regular uh, rulemaking process where Ed, uh, Ed or an agency proposes uh, a, a regulation, 
Uh, they will take public comment on that, uh, possibly revise the regulation and then release it. And then it will go into effect uh, a, month, a few months later. Uh, this is a process by which Ed has to invite stakeholders to the table. Uh, they quite literally convene them, usually in a room. Um, the one happening right now is virtual for, for pandemic reasons. Um, and sit them at a table and try and get them to reach consensus on a variety of topics in some cases. Um, this does not happen often. Uh, you know, I don't think it's expected right now. Um, what they're doing currently is that there is a, a group of folks. Uh, last week was the first week. There's one in November and one in December. Um, these folks take five to six hours a day and they talk uh, about proposals that Ed uh, puts together. Um, right now, they're discussing things like revamping the bar defense rule, which is designed to allow uh, defrauded um, or misled students um, to uh, essentially get their get their money back and get their eligibility back um, if they've been misled uh, most often, most frequently by a for-profit college, um, even though the rule does apply to all schools. Um, I would then say uh, there's other discussions going on about how to reform the student loan system, um, specifically the income-based repayment plans, of which there are several um, which can be confusing for borrowers, public service loan forgiveness, which folks have seen. Um, there's been a recent announcement that they're going to overhaul that program separate from the negotiated rulemaking, um, which is great. And they're going to give credit to a lot of folks um, out there who, uh, you know, by the virtue of making a payment that was a little bit late or a few cents short, or they just were given bad information from their servicer, which happened literally thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Um, that's going to give forgiveness to at least 22,000 people and give uh, payment credit to at least about half a million. Um, so those are great changes that we are wholly supportive of. However, um, there are permanent changes that need to be done through negotiated rulemaking as well. Uh, and finally, just on this particular rulemaking, there's a subcommittee on lifting the Pell ban. Um, so I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, there's a seven person subcommittee discussing how to implement that. Uh, so that, you know, topics include how does Ed interact with the prison uh, system? So the Department of Corrections and the Bureau of Prisons. Um, in implementing lifting uh, the ban? Um, how do you ensure that the programs are high quality, that are operating the best practices of students, um, that you're not getting programs that uh, students participate in, um, and then they graduate and they have to take a licensure exam and the credits they got, you know, can't be used in that state, you know, for that licensure exam or the state that they're gonna live in uh, upon release. Uh, technical questions um, about accreditation and about distance education. So there's a lot there um, that that's ongoing and that that subcommittee starts on uh, October 18th. Um, all of these things I've mentioned, the full committee sessions and then the subcommittee are all available. You can register and watch them live um, if you so choose and if you are interested. Uh, this process I just described will likely wrap up in the spring of 22. Um, I don't I don't know if they'll reach consensus or not, but regardless, Ed will uh, put out uh, final regulations uh, at the beginning of, of next year. Um, there will be public comment and they will uh, basically have those done before November. Um, so they will go into effect in July of 2023. Uh, they've also announced that we'll do another NEG reg uh, in, um, in 2022. Uh, that NEG reg will focus on uh, what's called the 9010 rule, which is designed to um, have for-profit for colleges get at least 10% of the revenue from non-federal sources. So it's a quality control uh, and a market function uh, rule uh, and the gainful employment rule, uh, which was also designed to uh, police bad outcomes specifically uh, not only at for-profit colleges, because it did apply to community colleges as well, and still does, um, but uh, to ensure that uh, vocational programs, career training programs are actually uh, producing quality educational and uh, market outcomes uh, for students. Uh, it's a good question, Jonathan. So, uh, you know, from a, a NEGREC perspective, there's a couple of different ways to interact with this process as an advocate and uh, folks who are paying attention. Um, one is there are uh, windows for public comment uh, every day uh, during the current NEGREC. So if you have something to say. Uh, there's a 30 minute window at the end of every session. The next one is uh, in early November. Um, it'll, that'll be on Ed's website. Um, and then uh, in early December as well. So there's 30 minute sessions in the immediate term. Uh, then in next year, uh, there will be an opportunity for folks to uh, uh, file comments, public comment, which I mentioned on the proposed rules. Uh, Ed Trust does that uh, frequently. Um, so you can do that too, and your organizations can do that as well. Um, and then uh, there will be another negotiated rulemaking. So if you work on those issues, gainful employment, 9010, um, you can apply to be a negotiator. Um, there are slots that correspond to uh, certain roles, two-year schools, four-year schools, for-profit schools, uh, current students, legal aid, uh, state attorneys general, things like that. Um, but you can apply uh, as well um, you know, to be a part of that. So those are all really exciting opportunities that are happening uh, on the executive side. Um, I want to touch it quick, quickly and then we can get to Q&A. 
uh, would just say on the loan side, uh, there's also a lot of unresolved issues regarding servicers. Uh, Naviance, is, who is the largest servicer currently, is transferring uh, a lot of their accounts, um, all of their accounts actually, to, to another uh, a debt collector actually, um, who's going to take up servicing uh, services. Uh, so that's a huge lift for the department to manage. Additionally, FedLoan, um, which runs all of the public service loan forgiveness accounts currently, uh, is also leaving the program. So those will also have to be reassigned. Uh, so from an individual perspective and an advocate perspective, please uh, be aware Ed should be sending things to loan holders. They may have questions. We're happy to be here as a resource. We work with a lot of people who are in uh, incredibly deep and know people at the department who are trying to manage these, these issues as well. Um, so other things they'll have to do, uh, re-regulate on Title IX, which is in process right now, um, figure out next steps on statewide assessments and accountability systems um, for a possible assessments next year, um, which we do expect to take place in the spring, um, but how those will, will go and how they'll interact with existing uh, statutory requirements under ESSA remains to be seen, uh, and additional guidance. So school discipline, um, uh, possibly out the end of this month or next, um, how to basically uh, end racial disparities there, curb uh, discriminatory practices, uh, you know, sort of decriminalize um, how, how students are treated. Uh, that's an issue. Um, also resource equity about uh, state and local funding. Um, that, that was a piece of the federal, um, the budget, the, the budget proposal. Um, that also is on the table as, long, as well as some other things. Um, I think you will see uh, that the administration will probably be a bit more active uh, next year than Congress. Uh, provided they do get this done. Uh, however, worth noting things like child nutrition reauthorization, uh, WIOA and ESRA, um, which are, uh, you know, in their own right, pretty substantial bills um, are all uh, possible topics for reauthorization and for Congress to work on in a bipartisan way. Um, it's not expected that there'll be another partisan reconciliation process next year as of now. Um, that could change. Uh, but as of now, that is not expected. Uh, and neither is uh, HEA or ESA reauthorizations. Uh, our legislative priorities, um, in addition to some of those things I just highlighted, uh, we have a suite of bills that address a lot of, uh, you know, existing areas in the law. Um, you know, things like college and career readiness, which there's, there'll be a session uh, later to come on that in a breakout. Educator equity and diversity, same thing. There's an optional session, I think, tomorrow at noon um, to learn more about state practices in, in educator diversity. Um, you also have access to safe, equitable, and positive learning environments. Um, this is another topic which will be discussed later on as a key focus of ours. So these are all bills that we're interested in um, and we'll, we'll basically be turning to in 2022 uh, to, to try and get more support for. Uh, Tracy, I see your question. So we have done, uh, you know, fly in, uh, they're called fly in days typically because folks fly in. Um, but yes, we have done those in the past and can certainly uh, talk about doing those in the future. I mean, I, I think those can be a tremendous asset um, for both folks on the committees that we work with to hear from. Um, and then obviously the states in which you work. Um, you know, ideally you have national legislators, federal members of Congress who are tuned into what's happening in their states. That's usually a prerequisite, even though some are better than others. Um, and having people share not only what's happening on the ground, but the work that they're doing can be incredibly influential. Um, so yes, we have done those obviously with, with COVID, things have changed a little bit. Um, but I do think once we are on the other side of reconciliation, things will be a bit more, uh, I don't know, normal is probably not quite the right word, but it will go, it will resemble more of the traditional legislative process, let's say, um, than has happened previously. Uh, touching quickly, because I know we're running up against time, um, fiscal 23 appropriations. So normally this is actually what's going on. Normally Congress is not hyper effective at passing changes to the law, so-called authorizing changes. Uh, that's changed because of reconciliation. Um, obviously, I just showed you Congress just spent about six trillion dollars, you know, over the past calendar year, and they're looking to spend a substantial amount more, um, all of which is needed, um, all of which makes sense for where we are right now. Um, but uh, what they do have to do outside of that process, which, again, is, is abnormal, uh, is pass appropriations every year uh, and keep the government open. Um, so right now, as I mentioned, we're still in limbo on fiscal 22, which ends in September. Um, they've passed the CR, but they have to figure out what's December to September look like in terms of funding existing programs. Um, you'll then see the State of the Union at the end of January. Uh, the, the budget um, proposal by the administration will come out in February, most likely. Um, and that's very helpful to learn about priorities and how anything that's changed from the prior budget and also how they respond to what might get passed in reconciliation. Um, for instance, there's $200 million for uh, the Hawkins program, which would fund uh, clinical learning for uh, teacher candidates at HBCUs and MSIs. 
uh, you know, that program, if that's funded there, how does the appropriations process fund that program? Um, do they put more on top or do they say, oh, no, we've already funded that. We're going to skip it this time. We can get back to it once that money is expended. Those are the types of questions they're going to be asking uh, about, you know, how do we interact with what's already been done. Uh, overall spending levels, a little bit unclear. Um, as I've mentioned before on prior presentations, they used to have spending caps that kind of automatically gave them a target to hit. Those are gone now. Um, they expired last year. So that's more of the wild, wild west than it's been in a long time. Um, you'll see the cabinet secretaries testify, and then you'll see a summer appropriations process where some bills will be written and marked up. Uh, but likely we will be back where we are uh, this, this year right now, and quite frankly, uh, every year, where there's a partial fund or a, a continuing resolution in September, and then a final deal uh, made in December. Uh, so finally, and we'll get to Q&A, uh, folks have more. I've tried to, hope I didn't miss anything in the chat. Um, midterms. Uh, you know, everything is going to lead up to this. And a lot of people are going to be talking about this more and more um, as, as, you know, non-policy oriented as that is, uh, it's where we are. So folks should know, you know, there are nine competitive Senate seats as rated by uh, the Center um, of Politics at University of Virginia, who's a very reliable source that I would encourage folks to read. They send out a, a newsletter. Um, five are currently held by Republicans, four are currently held by Democrats. Uh, Republican retirees include Senator Toomey in Pennsylvania. Um, as well as uh, it looks like um, Senator Johnson in Wisconsin, uh, and also uh, Senator Portman in Ohio. Um, so those are marquee races to watch. Um, also on the Democratic side, we have Senator Kelly in Arizona for re-election, re and Senator Warnock, who folks will remember was elected in Georgia in January, uh, also up for election, since that was a special election for a uh, partial term. Uh, also worth noting, uh, census population shifts and higher level of state government trifectas, which is to say total control, uh, by one party or the other. Uh, they do favor the Republicans um, or the GOP is abbreviated to take back House control. Um, anonymous polls of Hill staff have indicated they think uh, Republicans will take back House control. Uh, also, the budget chair, uh, Congressman Yarmouth of Kentucky, just announced his retirement this week, which is another sign um, that folks think Republicans will take back control of the House. Uh, they also will have the, the opportunity to draw districts in their favor. And right now, Many of those districts' maps remain unresolved. Only 10 uh, have been completed. Um, uh, finally, history does cut against the president's party. It almost always loses seats. I, I will say, though, that same anonymous poll of Hill staff uh, did think uh, that Democrats will keep the Senate. And I do think they have a slightly more favorable map overall. So I, I think the most likely scenario is that you're looking at a divided Congress um, after the midterms, which is all the reason why we have so much urgency uh, you know, right now. Because typically when Congress is divided, uh, it is not overly productive um, and certainly forecloses any possibility of using reconciliation again. So uh, I was kind of blown, blown through that at the end. I know we are almost at time. I hope that was uh, informative. Uh, circling back through the chat here, just to make sure. And thank you to John and Jesse and everybody on our, our staff who have been so helpful, Philip, um, and putting in supplemental materials here for folks. Um, there's just a tremendous amount of resources that I could, I could never fully grasp or get to. So uh, hugely, hugely, hugely helpful. Um, so thank you so much to all of them. Uh, going down here. Uh, so I know we are almost at time. So I uh, don't see anything yet, but please feel free. I would also say, too, that's my email. Um, if you email me, you will get a response. Uh, it may not always be uh, the response you're looking for or the most informed response, depending on if it is outside uh, my knowledge, given so much uncertainty right now, uh, but you will get a response. Um, and I am I'm happy to, to talk to anybody about any of this stuff. I know it is a, a lot to process um, in a pretty short amount of time. Um, the final thing I'll say um, while waiting to see if any questions come in uh, is just, you know, right now is the time. So if there are things you saw in the Build Back Better Act, Federal State Partnership for, you know, uh, free community college tuition, um, Pell, uh, early childhood, uh, universal pre-K, the nutrition piece is vital, and that's in there for $35 billion. Um, all of that stuff, HBCUs, MSIs, um, now is the time, you know, to, to get active on that. Um, they are trying to figure that out currently, um, and, and really that is going to be, uh, you, you know, something to, to, to think about. So feel free to reach out about that. Um, again, I mean, this is mostly, you, you know, all put together for you all to, to learn more about what's going on um, in, in the federal government. Um, and just be able to strategically plan for the future, um, just because there is so much information to sort through. Um, so I think with that, uh, I will let folks sign sign off and we can transition uh, back to 
Reed, uh, there is one question in the chat. It just came up. What message should we be sending now on ACP to senators? Did you address that? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, I would just say, uh, you know, I, I think it is important to emphasize the, the value um, of all of these programs. Um, you know, I would say taking it out of the, the advocacy context, you know, it's important for folks to know, you know, you've seen just tremendous growth um, in, you know, tuition overall and college costs overall. Um, you know, it, it, there's just a, a huge amount of value in having the federal government um, remain active in this space. Um, you know, you're seeing an increasing uh, disinvestment um, for folks at the state level um, in funding their public higher education systems. And we also know through antitrust work and reports like Segregation Forever and Broken Mirrors um, that there are massive disparities um, between you know, Black and Latino students in, in terms of degree attainment versus their white peers and mass underrepresentation um, of students in every single state. Uh, the demographics of the student body and public higher education systems uh, do not match the demographics of the state population overall. And specifically, Black and Latino students are uh, less represented than they should be in our public systems, which are publicly funded. Uh, so uh, that, that I would just say, you know, those are important points to grasp and, and understand. Uh, but yeah, with, with that, uh, I would thank everybody for hopping on. Again, my email is there. Um, please reach out anytime. Um, and I am happy to help, help uh, folks think about this stuff and, and learn how we can all be maximally effective to, to hopefully achieve these goals. Uh, you know, as, as we go forward, um, it's uh, an interesting time, um, but it's good to see the federal government being active on a lot of these issues. Thanks, everybody. Great job, Reed. Talk to you later. Yep. Thanks, Sarah.